Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. It's good to see everybody on the chat. Uh, hopefully you are here because uh, we have a free workshop that is on intro to Kubernetes and GitOps. So we'll have um, a range of short talks that cover the concepts. And then most importantly, we will walk you through these steps so that, um, you know, there's plenty of videos out there and talks about kind of how to get started, but we will actually help you to go through the steps and be able to experience GitOps for yourself if this is your first time. So hopefully you have your laptops ready and you'll be able to follow along. And we um, have a two hour bracket that um, we've set up here, but usually we finish within about 90 minutes. Uh, we've got a lot of great content here, so we'll decide on like how long we need, but we are here to happily wait for everybody to get through all the steps. So please don't be shy and uh, follow along. And uh, we'll happy to be, make sure, um, we're happy to make sure that you get through all the steps and even some of the pre -wecs, like it doesn't take that long to set up. So you should have a pretty successful experience. So my name is, is Tama Nakahara. I lead the developer experience team here at a company called Weaveworks. And I'm very excited to have a couple of other speakers here from our engineering and our product side who will go through these various uh, topic areas for you. So just to give an overview, um, I'll give sort of a, a quick, quick intro of who we are, um, why we're so committed to GitOps, um, and uh, then we'll have the intro to Kubernetes part and sort of Part of that is sort of how, uh, if you've heard the term GitOps and you got excited about it, how it's very much like a natural evolution uh, to Kubernetes itself. So if you're getting started with any of those, um, hopefully you'll see how, if you're getting started with Kubernetes, how GitOps is something that um, will definitely be something that you could take advantage of and you'll get immediate um, both technical and business benefits from being able to take on those um, methodologies and tools. Um, and then we will go into the workshop part uh, where I'll kind of give a quick overview for you to have the vision of like where you want to see yourself and what huge benefits you'll be um, able to uh, have once you've gone through these steps. And then uh, we'll be happily going through those actual getting started steps so that you can have something concrete um, to play around with uh, afterwards. Um, and then one key part that I'm really excited to cover is um, if some of you have come here and uh, maybe you've heard of uh, the open source project called Flux or have wanted to try it out, um, it is, um, you know, in the CNCF, we're getting very close to graduated. So we're a very like recognized project and, you know, one of the, as the TOC has said, one of the categories is the an obvious choice um, to have for GitOps. Um, but one great thing about Flux is that it's highly unopinionated. It's, you know, it's very variable and there's a lot of things that you can do with it and you can leverage it in a very powerful ways. Um, but for people who are just getting started, um, that can also leave you with like decision fatigue. We're like, wow, it's so unopinionated and I can do all these things. I feel like I have to, um, you know, make all these, do all this research and make all these decisions up front. So we're really excited that um, we also have this open source um, product called Weave GitOps that kind of gets you started right away. It gets you going in a particular direction, especially with your repo structure. It sort of sets up uh, your repo structure for you um, so that you can kind of start and then decide as you're learning whether that works for you, whether um, you know you want to make changes, whether you know you want something slightly different. But I think you know as a learner, it can often help to just kind of be given something, then you can work with that as opposed to kind of this open field. So we're really excited that we'll go through these steps and then um, Mark on our team will also give a little bit of history of um, why we decided to provide this um, ready-made repo structure so that hopefully that will be really helpful. Um, so I'm really excited to get started. We'll do, like I said, we'll do an overview um, and then uh, we'll have the intro to Kubernetes and GitOps. Uh, then we'll um, go through the steps of the workshop first with sort of the turkey dinner as your vision and then the actual steps. And then once you've gone through that, we'll give a little bit more um, content around the repo structure so that you can leave this workshop with something already ready to play with that you can share with your teams and that you have a little bit of understanding of like the broader and the more specific areas of how um, we've set up GitOps for people to be successful. 
So I hope that that's what you're looking for. Um, please leave um, your questions and comments in the chat. Um, tell us where you're from. Uh, you know, please don't be shy about your questions there. Um, we're happy to help everybody. And we love when someone's brave enough to just say like, oh, hey, I'm actually a couple steps behind. We're perfectly happy to help you. All right, so let's jump into this. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Tomo. Oh. We've also got David Harris on the product side and Mark Emice, uh, uh, principal engineer on the engineering side. Um, and we work for a company called Weaveworks. Uh, oh, and I should also say our trusted community manager, Stacy, is in the background here and making sure that this all uh, works out really well. And we've got another community manager who's just joined, um, Vanessa. So um, we are all part of Weaveworks. Um, if you've heard of it, you've probably heard of us through um, GitOps, which our company coined, our CEO coined that term. Um, and it was really founded on this whole background of many, many years of being in open source and working on various projects. If you're way back in the day, you might even heard of uh, WeaveNet, which is our CNI. Um, but most recently, and probably most profoundly, um, we have Flux and Flagger, which is in the CNCF, and we also built Cortex, which extends um, Prometheus capabilities. And so it was really around Flux that we um, kind of discovered a way of doing things and a way that we were noticing other people were doing things um, that we decided maybe could be called GitOps. And it was really amazing to see how that term just really took off and people um, really felt that it resonated with them. Uh, and it's really exciting that um, so Stacy, Vanessa and I are part of the developer experience team where a lot of these um, projects have started. Um, and one of them is Flagger, which is by Stefan in our team, which is um, provides progressive delivery that builds upon Flux, which, as we said, builds upon Kubernetes. So it's really part of this great evolution in which, you know, you can uh, do GitOps, you can do um, progressive delivery, which means like canary deployments, A-B testing, etc. All through these various open source tools that are out there. So if you haven't heard of us, welcome, welcome to these workshops. We have many of these talks on our calendar. Stacy and Vanessa has many of these talks on the calendar that you can see on our meetup page uh, and our website is weave.works. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I think most of us, because of COVID times, we know how to use Zoom right now. Um, but uh, as we remind people, please make sure that you post your questions as uh, to everyone, uh, especially if you're answering other people's questions, make sure that you choose everyone so that uh, people can see your responses. We've often had quite um, uh, vigorous uh, conversations going on in the chat. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, just going back a slide, David Harris is on the product side and Mark Emeis is um, on the engineering side. So we'll be covering all these various areas for you. Uh, and so with that, um, we'll be sharing these links in the chat, but the uh, core getting started parts that we'll be covering uh, is at this link. So you can start opening that up if you want. Uh, Stacy will put it in the chat. Um, okay, so with that, why don't we jump right into the intro to Kubernetes and GitOps, which Mark will be covering. Hey, Mark. Hey, Tamo. How are you? All right. <laughs> I'm really glad we just had a fire alarm uh, practice. So I'm glad it happened before all this. <laughs> so, be nice and quiet. So yeah, take it away. Okay, will do. So uh, just... Uh, a note for folks, uh, sometimes I get to talking fairly fast and uh, hopefully my colleagues will slow me down if I get to do that because uh, not having that uh, interaction with people and seeing reactions on faces like, hey, I don't understand this or you're going way too fast uh, is something I, I rely on. And we've given this a few times. So uh, just ping me or uh, put a message in chat if uh, if I am going too fast. So. Uh, thanks again, uh, Tamo. So as Tamo mentioned, I'm going to be covering uh, an introduction to Kubernetes and GitOps. Uh, it's going to be a flyby or a 50,000 foot kind of view. Uh, but the nice thing about the webinar is we are then going to uh, do some hands-on work with David that he's going to guide us through uh, to that to hopefully solidify some of these concepts. So with that, let's get started. So a little bit about me, principal engineer here at Weaveworks. Uh, I've been in the industry for a while. I've been uh, kind of in and around the container space for at least around five years. Uh, so experience with Docker Swarm, experience with Kubernetes, experience with other distributed systems in the past, uh, Erlang, uh, et cetera, trying to build that. So that distributed system experience is something uh, that's important when you're moving to a Kubernetes space. So if you need to reach me, uh, I'm Mark Emice on Twitter, Pale Mountain Writer on GitHub. 
there's my email address marked out of my and uh, but uh, yeah, if you join our Weave com uh, community Slack channel, uh, which we have for Weave GitOps, is a great place to ask questions, and uh, you know not only answered by by those of us here, but uh, others in the community who are also using Weave GitOps. So, quick uh, quick outline of what we're going to cover today. So we're going to go over an introduction to, to Kubernetes. So you know at a real high level, it's kind of a modern ops stack for the cloud, and we'll talk a little bit about that containers. Uh, it's you know has a few uh, real core moving pieces with a you know core API uh, with with uh, primitives inside of it that you're going to take advantage of when you try and run your uh, cloud native or uh, distributed applications on it. So a couple of those would be like namespaces, uh, pods, services, et cetera. And I know I'm flying by this, so uh, but we will go into more details here in a second. But uh, again, it's not just those few primitives. It expands out to you know services, events, secrets, configuration, et cetera. Basically, uh, everything you need for a distributed application there. So you're going to have apps and storage and coordination, et cetera, in that Kubernetes. So it is extensible, so you can build on top of it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well with uh, something called uh, custom resource definition or CRDs uh, and the controllers and operators. So when we talk about GitOps, uh, you know, Kubernetes is a very complicated environment, uh, both itself and uh, for the applications you're going to run on those. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So having some a, a tool like GitOps or a concept like GitOps and tooling that we're going to show today uh, is necessary in, in order to kind of quote wrangle all of that complexity uh, into one place that you can work on. So uh, one thing when looking at Kubernetes or looking at GitOps tooling, you want uh, something that kind of matches the environment that you're also going to be running in. And so uh, those are all cloud native. So when you look at uh, using something with Kubernetes, uh, you'll need something that is following itself uh, cloud native best practices for Kubernetes. Not going to talk much about best practices for cloud native applications. That would take a long time to get through that. Uh, lots of good stuff in there, but I'm not going to talk much about that. So uh, GitOps is kind of tied, you know, with the name kind of clues you in Git. Uh, but not Git necessarily, right? So it doesn't have to be Git, uh, but it needs to be version controlled and immutable. Um, we'll talk more about that. And then, of course, the ops part of ops. Uh, so, you know, you've heard of CICD. The CD stands for continuous delivery. And GitOps really uh, folds into that CD space, only it flips the model sort of on its head. So, uh, and again, it's going to be declarative configuration and talk about automation. So with that introduction to Kubernetes, so you might ask, you know, what is Kubernetes? Uh, and I'll, I'm going to butcher this quote, but, you know, uh, one cannot be told what Kubernetes is. One has to experience Kubernetes themselves. That's not quite true, but uh, it's kind of a fun quote that's been rattling around in my head a little bit. But I'm going to try and cover some of it. So, so when I'm asked what is Kubernetes, uh, and again, asked from somebody who is in the field to somebody who's really not in the field, you know, what is it? So uh, I'm kind of fun on the first one. I usually answer, you know, it's a platform for distributed applications, uh, but sometimes, or it's a platform for platforms, or it's a modern cloud platform, or it's an open source platform for operations, or it's a platform for hosting 12 factor apps. So um, why I say a distributed application is when you, start to think about your applications in a cloud native space and you start to decompose them into microservices you start to follow the 12 factor application uh principles and guidelines there uh, you need a platform that you can run those applications on that can deal with things like failure uh scale out uh, how i keep things secret how i route traffic how i talk uh into uh, the objects inside of my cluster, how I talk outside of my cluster. So Kubernetes provides that whole platform, that framing, if you will, in order to run those distributed applications. Uh, if before Kubernetes, you know, you would do something like, you know, network together a bunch of VMs, but that only provided you the OS, right? On top of that, now you have to have all of these different uh, pieces of machinery uh, in order to support your distributed application. Um, maybe some of you might think back to the, there was something called Co Co Cobra, uh, a long time ago uh, that was all about a distributed infrastructure in order for running applications. So Kubernetes kind of codifies all that, makes it a platform for hosting your distributed applications. So one thing that's important to look at, and I've probably said it about 10 times, uh, when you start looking at what is Kubernetes, really when it boils down to as a platform, right? 
So you install this platform and then you leverage its capabilities uh, inside of there. And how you leverage it is gonna dovetail into why GitOps is so important here. So I'm mean, gonna just continue on this thread a little bit, pulling a little bit. Again, it's at the 50,000 foot level. If you're very familiar with Kubernetes, uh, hopefully all of this resonates with you. If not, please post in the chat and let's let's talk about it. Uh, but so it, Kubernetes, it's open source software managed by the CNCF uh, of the Linux Foundation. So uh, that means you know that it's available. Anybody can go to the web and download it and and run it yourself. Uh, it's akin to you know Linux. Linux was open source. Uh, if those of you that remember back to the beginning of the early days of Linux, right? It was it was all great. I could download the source and compile it myself, and then there was a whole bunch of shenanigans that you had to go through in order to get an actual uh, Linux environment up and running. Kubernetes, you know, was on a similar path, but there's a lot of distributions and what not available for Kubernetes that simplifies a lot of that path. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but uh, at its base, Kubernetes is really a handful of things. It's a control plane for managing Kubernetes itself. It's an API server for interacting with Kubernetes. Uh, it's a data plane that all of your applications will leverage. And then it's your workloads that run on it. So that's what Kubernetes is. And again, 50,000 foot level, but just kind of trying to wrap your head around it. If you think of uh, running a program on your Linux box, you're gonna run your quote program or your application on a, on a Kubernetes platform. So I mentioned it's open source. Uh, it's a standard framework, but one of the things that's really important, so we talked about uh, there's multiple ways to get Kubernetes. Uh, conformance testing is important. So when you uh, go to write your application and run it on a Kubernetes, you want, to, you want some assurances that if I build it on Kind, which is Kubernetes in Docker that we're going to talk about during our example today, uh, you want some assurances that if I build it there, it's going to run when I move it to a more production instance uh, or somebody else's desktop, right? We don't want the uh, the old uh, joke that we used to say is, you know, that, well, the software runs on my machine and everybody else is kind of shrugging going, well, it doesn't work on mine, so it doesn't help. So conformance testing really helps there, but, but there are different experiences possible. So if you're going to run self-hosted versus a managed Kubernetes, some of those managed Kubernetes aren't going to give you control over the control plane. That's what they want to manage, right? So they'll let, let, let manage that aspect, whereas on, on premise, you're going to manage that control plane aspect. So, and of course, when you talk about a, a dev environment versus, or a test environment versus a production environment, you could have differences there. But the key thing, the platform should insulate you from those differences. So, if, for example, if I'm using storage in a dev test environment, it may be local storage and really fast. And, and guess what? I don't care about it. So, but that I should talk to that storage in the same manner that I do in a production environment where it is sharded and it's, you know, it's backed up and it's a full environment for storage. Again, the platform, again, going back to that, you want to make sure that that's a standard interface that you're talking to. And that's where those conformance testings come in. Uh, I have mostly in quotes here because, or in uh, italics because the experience can vary. So uh, I talked about, you know, how do I talk to, to my application when it's running on Kubernetes? That may differ when you're dealing with cloud, uh, different cloud providers, because they're going to provide some help for you as you host your applications there. So one of the key concepts that Kubernetes brings uh, is something called desired state or declared state. Um, what you're doing when you interact with your Kubernetes environment is you're you're not saying how to run something, you're saying what you want to run. Again, the platform is gonna provide the how, and that's what you want. You wanna leverage that how. So really what we're deploying, right, are containerized applications. Uh, and we wanna just, in, we want to tell Kubernetes what we want running, not how. Right. So, and that's key when you talk about an imperative design versus declarative. So, imperative design is more how, right? I want you to do this, followed by this, followed by that. And in Kubernetes, no, you need to have that environment that's declarative because of things like failures, retries, and backups, and dealing with issues that occur when. Uh, you're running a distributed application. So that's that's a key point there on um, that desired state and using declarative versus in an uh, in, in imperative environment. So one of the things that Kubernetes provides for us is that framework of how Kubernetes works. Under the covers, there's controllers that are driving the states of the different primitive objects. And I mentioned CRDs or 
custom resource definitions before, that's where you have the ability to add to that data set that's available through the control plane of controllers that you can interact with. So that's how you can plug your application in and leverage the Kubernetes platform in order to take advantage of it. It's not saying you have to do that for all that. I mean, you can host your uh, WordPress and database if you want it on Kubernetes without any kind of controllers themselves. But if you want to change the behavior of, of your systems, you'll be writing controllers and custom resource definitions. So a little more of an example of the imperative nature versus declarative nature. So uh, in Kubernetes, something called a pod is the lowest level of a primitive that Kubernetes deals with. So everything that's running in the system is running as a pod. A pod is comprised of one or more containers uh, in your system. So when I say a pod is running, think of it as, you know, at least one container is up and running. Uh, and it has, uh, we're not going to deal, dive really deep into that, but it has uh, different patterns in the pod itself. So you can have, you know, uh, emit containers that set up things. Uh, Kubernetes is going to do things on your behalf when it runs that pod that you want to take care of, but you don't want to be telling Kubernetes that it has to do all those things. You want the platform providing that for you. So as an example here, I tell Kubernetes in this command uh, that I want to run this, uh, this older version of Weave GitOps here. So what Kubernetes is going to do is it's going to say, okay, I have one pod running. It happens to be comprised of one container. That's it. Um, I can specify like if I want that pod to restart if it fails or things like that, but really the life cycle is pretty limited here because all I did was tell it one thing running, right? And, and Kubernetes is just happy to do that, but that's not really taking advantage of what we mean by declarative. So if we switch it to be a declarative, I would wrap my pod, I would define a specification for what it is to be running for my pod in something called a deployment. So the deployment just tells Kubernetes, hey, I have a deployment and I'd like you to have one of these running. So the difference there is I'm gonna tell Kubernetes about a deployment and tell it what it means to be running and how it looks based on this pod. So in that example, I would say I want one pod of you know, the WeGo application that I had before and I would want it running. So now Kubernetes has the ability to manage that pod on my behalf because I've described it as a deployment. So that declarative primitive uh, allows you to get out of that imperative life cycle, right? You don't have to get paged when the pod fails, or if you need more capacity, you can just bump up the deployment and Kubernetes handles it for you. Um, so there's you know, other things. So pods, again, is the base building block, but Kubernetes has things called jobs, which run once. You can tell it how many of those jobs you want to run. Again, the concept is I'm defining a specification of what I want to run and I give it to Kubernetes and it runs it for me. Uh, I have a concept of cron job. So I can say at this schedule, I need you to you know, start this pod and do this operation. Uh, stateful sets is kind of a, a, a little bit of a, a specification or a change uh, to a particular deployment. Uh, it's specifying more like uh, I need a quorum. So I need a set number of pods and I need them to come up in this order. Uh, but there's lots of primitives inside of Kubernetes that you can leverage for your distributed applications. And I know I keep saying distributed application, but like your database, if you were to run it inside of Kubernetes, you would want a stateful set so that you could have multiple uh, pods running uh, so that you can deal with scale out and failure and all that sort of stuff and let Kubernetes take advantage of it. It all boils down to these control loops. So uh, we're Kubernetes itself is, is taking your request for a desired state and it's trying to achieve that with the resources that it has available to it. So it's doing that control loop where it's taking the desired state, uh, looking at the actual state and driving the actual state into that desired state. So, uh, so I think I'm reiterating some of this. You're declaring your desired state, you apply it to the Kubernetes environment, those control loops, then using the primitives that are based in the platform itself, drive your application towards that declared state. Why is that important? Uh, it's important because uh, failures happen in the distributed environment, right? All of us have had that where something crashes. Uh, the nice thing is, is you told Kubernetes in my simple example, I want one of them running. If it crashes, Kubernetes recognizes that one of them is not running now. So it restarts it for you. And that's a really nice benefit of a platform there. And that's where the declarative state really helps us. If you were trying to do all that imperative, you would have to do the same sort of, hey, watch 
to see if that fails. If it fails, I want you to restart it. Uh, but now if it's imperative like that, then you have to handle all of those failures. Uh, what happens if I uh, isn't if your call is not item potent uh, because, well, how are you going to deal with that? So there's a lot of complexities that get switched and moved on their head when you deal with declarative nature. So let's uh, so we're going to shift gears a little bit from Kubernetes itself to GitOps, and hopefully you'll see the similarities of what GitOps is uh, and how it relates to Kubernetes itself. If you remember earlier, I talked about a cloud native pattern, and that's where you want to GitOps. That's where you're going to see how these kind of relate. So we talked about that state of my distributed application. I got a database. I have a message queue. I have uh, let's go with the shopping cart. I have a payment service. So I have all these services that have to interact for my application to be up and running. Um, what if I can capture that whole declared state and deal with it as an entity in itself? That's where Git comes in. So if I could take that whole snapshot really and represent it as a single artifact, that's what I want to do. And that's where GitOps really comes into play. So you could say that that is reminiscent of a Git commit. Uh, into my repository, and you're right. Uh, the git commit is, you know, the differences of the state before my commit and the and what it's going to look like when I apply my commit. That's that's kind of the mindset you want to get in. And when you start thinking of git ops declarative nature, is that uh, I'm just defining what it is and what it should be. So uh, Kubernetes is all driven by YAML manifests, <clears throat> and those are easy to because they're textual, easy to handle and get, and easy to easy to keep uh, individual artifacts and uh, know exactly about the imperative state that they are, uh, sorry, the immutable state that they are, which is important. So, but really GitOps is more than just, you know, a Git commit, right? There's a whole bunch of plumbing and machinery that has to happen in order to make that work. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So there is an open source group uh, that's working to define uh, what is GitOps. So uh, they've put forth these four principles that we're gonna talk about, and we've already talked a little bit about them, but so it's declarative. So the system itself, in order to be considered GitOps, it needs to be managed uh, declaratively, which means I can't have a bunch of imperative calls that I have to deal with that impotency and things like that. I want it to be all declarative state. It needs to be versioned and immutable, What's really important about that is I need to be able to get back in a previous. So if I have to roll back, I need to be ensured that I'm able to roll back. And additionally, I need to be able to scale out. So if I have immutable objects that I'm scaling out, I'm not having skew between them because I know they're immutable. And guess what? If they do diverge, I can I can kill them and start them again. You may have heard of um, uh, sometimes it's called cattle cattle versus pets, but that's where we want to say, hey, I can stamp out all of these objects and they always look the same when I stamp them out. So that's really important. But again, it's that desired state is the thing that's versioned and immutable. So that uh, my state needs to be pulled automatically into my operating environment and it needs to be continuously reconciled. So when I see a difference, I need to, the platform needs to spring into action in order to make my actual state match my desired state. And we want that to happen continuously. So, so those four principles, declarative, versioned and immutable, pulled automatically into the system and continuously reconciled. So why does this benefit businesses? You could have greater visibility. So again, we're gonna standardize how workloads make their way into a Kubernetes environment. Uh, that gives me the ability to define standard metrics across uh, all of my systems and how that happens. Uh, so security switches a little bit. If you think about a continuous delivery uh, running in, let's say Travis CI inside of um, uh, GitHub, uh, it needs credentials in order to talk to all of those systems that it's going to push to. GitOps is going to flip that around and say, no, no, GitOps, the cluster itself is going to have a specific set of credentials for it that allow it to talk to the, to the repo in order to get its artifacts. So both uh, can be code manifest and it can also be image artifacts. So because of that, less permissions need to be moved around. They're isolated inside of a a particular cluster itself. Uh, and now I have a, a standard way. Again, I'm using a standard platform. So I have a standard way to get logging, uh, metrics about it, all of that auditability that I need uh, comes because we've switched that model around. So because I can audit it, I have standard ways to do logging, et cetera. Uh, I may have an easier job with compliance, standardization, auditability, et cetera. 
So as a developer, uh, it simplifies your deployment model. So, uh, so that's both locally and remote, right? Because you're pushing artifacts to <clears throat> an artifact server, either be it Git or your image server in there. And those changes are being pulled automatically. Again, back to that principles thing, they're pulled automatically into your cluster in order to operate. So if you think back to the, the um, days uh, where we were doing web development early on, having a server run and see your changes automatically was a huge time saver uh, and it accelerated my development time at, the, at, at that time. Uh, it's a similar mechanism, right? We're recognizing those changes, we're seeing them, we're applying them and we're making your environment match your, match your desired state. So. This, you can reduce the amount of information you need to know about how your application is running. You just know what it is to, for your application to mean be running. So I don't have to deal with setting up, you know, all of the different secrets and storage and et cetera. I just define what I need and GitOps is gonna take care of that for me along with Kubernetes. So the other thing is, as I mentioned security is the individual developers don't need access to write to Kubernetes. Now they may need access for other mechanisms, troubleshooting, figuring out what went wrong, et cetera, but they don't need that necessarily in order to deploy those applications. So, uh, and platform as a team, of course, are gonna really like that, that they know that they have a better control over who has access to my cluster, right? So that goes back to that audit, uh, uh, the auditability and you know getting metrics and trying to watch that so less permissions, uh, it's easier to roll back. Again, the platform team is uh, or the platform itself even is applying the desired state. So if we know if something failed, well we're going to go back using that GitOps principle and go back to an immutable object that we know works right because we have that track and we have that reference uh, back to knowing when it worked. So we have that standardized delivery mechanism for all of our Kubernetes clusters and all of our different environments. So kind of as a summary, you know, what is GitOps then? Well, it's a declarative configuration, version controlled and immutable artifacts, and it's your single source of truth. So when you want to see how your application is running uh, or what your application runs, you can see that in Git and you can see the changes and how it progressed over time by leveraging uh, Git and the mechanisms that are built into Git. But it's not just that, right? It's automated delivery of declarative resources. You can't say that enough. Uh, so the agents running in the cluster and reconciling the differences for you. So it's back to that control loop or a closed loop. So at this point, it should seem very similar to what we were talking about before uh, it, with Kubernetes being a control loop and managing its state. GitOps is following that same principles uh, and keeping your system up to date based on your outside environment, which is Git, uh, and it's defining uh, what should be running in your system. So a little bit more on that. So if we take a look at this example, I, I write a YAML file, I check it into Git, it gets version controlled, it gets pulled down automatically, delivered to my Kubernetes cluster uh, with GitOps, it's actually running inside your cluster and it's that closed loop. So as things change in Git uh, and I have auditability, I can take advantage of pull requests, et cetera, et cetera. I can diff things really easily. Uh, then when Kubernetes, when GitOps gets that and applies it to the cluster, you just have a nice control over that. So if we take a look at a traditional system, you'd have a cl cluster. We remember earlier on, we mentioned one of the core components of Kubernetes is the API server. So I have developers, they check in code into Git. Uh, then I have a CI system that's gonna go ahead and build artifacts and of course publish those artifacts. But now I'm gonna have this CD process uh, that runs inside of my CICD and it's, it's, it needs kubectl access to my cluster, right? Which means I have to have a secret or permissions in order to talk to the API server so that I can get my system running uh, on there. And then Kubernetes of course is gonna talk to the registry, but we flip that up again, that permission model around to where it's a pull based model. The cluster itself knows, hey, because I'm running GitOps, I know when my configuration change, I have a change in the expected state. Please make that, uh, apply that to my cluster and drive me towards uh, that proper state. 
So a high level in general, general, so it's a Git-centric way of implementing continuous delivery. Again, flipping that model a bit. Benefits, you can have increased productivity, enhanced developer experience, improved stability, uh, high reliability. Again, since we're building, a, it's a cloud native application that's running inside your system. So you can have the higher reliability, uh, less you know, single points of failure. You have consistency and standardization across how you get workloads running and stronger security. Uh, degrees. We had those four principles we talked about, declarative, version controlled, and immutable, uh, automatically pulled, and then continuously reconciled inside your system. Those, those four points are really important when evaluating GitOps solutions and how you want to deploy workloads into your system. So we GitOps uh, kind of overcomes those problems of tightly coupled CI and CD processes. So Take a breath. I know I went really fast, but I would been kind of long as well. But uh, at this point, I could take some questions or we can move into the uh, hands on. Yes, we have uh, a couple of great ones. David answered a few. Um, some of them brought, says, um, where does GitOps fit in the uh, CI ecosystem and infrastructure as code? Uh, I think you answered some of that, but um, I don't know if you want to kind of reiterate maybe infrastructure as code. I'm not sure. Sure, that, that's a great question because so the infrastructure as code is going to represent your desired state of what you want running. So you can still use all of the infrastructure as code pieces uh, and have those applied to the cluster itself. So again, GitOps uh, is running inside the cluster. It's looking for those manifests that we want. You codify that in code to generate those manifests. Those get pulled into Kubernetes automatically for you. That helps. And then I hope that question. helps. Yeah. yeah. I think so, but let us know if it doesn't. Um, and then I think David answered a little bit, but might as well bring it up. Um, how tightly does GitOps integrate with each of these? Uh, an SCM like Git, CI system, Kubernetes, does GitOps handle feature flags? Hmm. I'm uh, so so feature flags to me is a is a somewhat orthogonal concept, and we'll. We'll talk a little bit about, it's not per se feature flags, but when we talk more about the directory structure and how you lay things out, uh, it'll become clear about how tightly we're integrated with SCM and how a feature flagging like capability, because I know uh, it's more at the cluster level than at you know individual aspects of the cluster, but it doesn't provide feature flagging solution itself. Yeah, I feel like I, I don't know, I kind of went around, uh, around on that, but the SCM, Definitely tight integration. The CI, the, there isn't an integration there uh, because we flipped the, the CD part into it. So the CI still runs, still builds your container images and sets all that stuff up. And then it's a handoff into GitOps running in the cluster. Thank you. Well, that was definitely a fairly meaty intro to Kubernetes and GitOps. I hope it was uh, helpful. It's great to see these questions. Um, and again, some of them have been answered in the chat. So um, we can share those later as well um, if people want to follow up with those, those written answers. Um, cool. So uh, hopefully, uh, depending on where you are in your journey, um, you know, that was a helpful start on sort of this history and, and why GitOps is a, a key part of Kubernetes. And hopefully you're excited to try it yourself. So why don't we get into it? Um, as I mentioned for this part, I will give it just a very, very quick kind of vision of the cooked dinner so that as David and I go through these steps, you know, they're not that many steps, but you know, it helps to always like when you start getting into the weeds to like, remember, like this is, this is the end goal. Um, so I will share, hopefully this will work. I had already opened this up. So yeah, please let me know if you can see these slides. Um, excellent. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, the biggest, you know, this powerful um, open source project called Flux is uh, probably what a lot of people, you know, have been using, or that's why you've come here and you're interested. Um, it is, uh, you know, just gone through security audits, which is very exciting. So, you know, very great to find, you know, validation on its security, its reliability, um, you know, all these great reasons that people want to have GitOps and want to be able to use a tool that, you know, has been validated in the CNCF as we are almost at graduation. Um, 
However, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, it is a very unopinionated um, uh, tool, uh, project, you know, that's out there. And so we're really excited um, if you came to one of our events um, in October, we called it the GitOps One Stop Shop. Uh, it really showed how so many companies, we had Microsoft, VMware, Red Hat, um, D2IQ, the Mesosphere people, um, Amazon, you know, uh, all these people have built on Flux because they know and trust that this is the tool that they want to use to provide GitOps to their end customers. Um, Stacy can definitely follow up with those links if you're interested to see those as well, Like, because if you want to uh, get the most powerful GitOps through Flux, you know, maybe you're already using Azure. So you'll find out that Microsoft offers uh, Azure Arc Kubernetes that provides GitOps through that, um, or through Amazon, EKS Anywhere is using Flux. So all these areas, right, are ways that if you want to get to that end goal, you're already on one of the um, cloud offerings um, or, or with OpenShift as well, or you can use any of those together. Um, our company, Weave GitOps, uh, I'm sorry, our company, WeaveWorks, has created Weave GitOps in the same vein, uh, built on Flux. Um, and so this is what we'll be using because we have an open source and free version. Um, so we'll be using it as kind of an educational tool for you to be able to get to GitOps really quickly and to be able to um, gain the benefits of Flux um, in a way that, as I mentioned, for example, with the directory structure and other types of areas, we will give you the opinionated version for you so that you can get up and running really quickly and then you can continue to learn and decide what works for you. So that's where we want to get you to the end of this workshop. Um, so a little bit of background, as I mentioned, we're at the company Weaveworks, where part of this whole um, journey is that we are dedicated to having you succeed on your cloud native journey, um, on your GitOps journey. Um, and so what we've put together um, with Weave GitOps is something that, you know, is um, neutral. It uses all Kubernetes um, options um, and it is, you know, helping you to get on your um, GitOps journey. So what we're providing here uh, is Kubernetes first and um, um, Flux first um, and, you know, again, is part of your cloud native journey. So hopefully you'll be able to experience that right away and see how you're leveraging all the things that Mark was just talking about um, in a really quick and easy way um, so that you can figure out what works for you. Um, what's behind this is not just us wanting to create products and offerings out there. But um, if you've seen any of our past GitOps Days events that Stacy has fantastically put together, we've had um, you know, speakers from so many different companies all validating that GitOps is not just something that's technical and fun and cool, but it is absolutely the way that helps businesses be successful. Um, because as um, the Dora research has shown, all these different companies that have been able to maximize their velocity um, have been able to find all the business value out of that. So GitOps is one way to really maximize your velocity. So you lower your uh, number of failed deploys. Um, if you have failures, it's really easier to troubleshoot. Um, you know, you have that reliability when you're going from dev to prod or make changes in prod. And then also um, your mean time to recovery is, is amazing. Um, in our early days, our story is that one engineer made an error and we were able to bring the system back up in I think about an hour or something. And that's when we said, oh, wow, you know, we know what the state is that we want it to be. And once that's all set up, you know, thanks to all these components of Kubernetes and Flux, we're able to bring things up. So we wanna make sure that others share in that same um, value experience. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, what we're dedicated here is to giving you something that is Kubernetes native and Flux native. So um, most or all the power of Flux is something that you'll be able to experience once you go through this setup. Um, and some basic things to be reminded, you know, if you've heard that GitOps is just for apps or just for operations, it's really for both. Um, and our offering here, you'll be able to see that you'll be able to leverage GitOps across so many different kinds of use cases as many of our community users and customers have been able to do. Um, and as I said earlier, Microsoft, VMware, Amazon, you know, Red Hat, it was just really validating to hear from these companies that uh, this is ready technology. That's why we're this close to getting to graduation in CNCF. It is very, very stable and very, very secure. Um, and so we're really emphasizing your total productivity, right? Everything from deploy to um, your CI, to your workflows, your observability. Um, this is something that we're hoping to get you to. 
Um, so part of this is your um, journey through the GitOps matur maturity model. So today, if you're just getting started, maybe you'll just be working with single apps, but the cooked dinner, right? Think, think of this as your starting point to, in the future, doing multi-tenancy, thinking about policy, having complex deployment management. Um, so we are here and dedicated to get you from wherever you are today to wherever you want to be. Um, these are the, uh, this is the support and um, community that we offer to you, as well as um, the products that we hope will get you there. So hopefully this will give you a taste of that, where you'll be using free and open source and get you started. So a reminder again, the importance of velocity um, to your business, and these are the tools that we will use to get you there. So I'm really excited that we will get you through these steps and hopefully you'll have something, you know, not just concepts and talks, but you'll actually have something that you can um, play, continue to play around with and um, share with your teams. So with that, I will hand it over to David, who will get you through those steps. Thank you so much. All right, let me share my screen and we can get going. So it's great to see a good number of people here. So yeah, get your laptops ready. And I think Stacy has shared the links, so we'll be following along here. Yeah, so the only thing is I might not see things in the chat, but obviously Mark's with us as well, so he will be able to help out. If questions do come up, please let me know. Uh, I'm David Harris. I'm a product manager working at Weaveworks, and I look after Weave GitOps Core, uh, which is built on the excellent foundation of Flux. So today we're going to go through our getting started guide. Uh, uh, someone could put another link in the chat just to make sure folks have got the right one and then we can get started and basically we will be installing weave gitops onto a kind cluster and we will be deploying an application which is called pod info uh, which is a simple go based web app and then we will be seeing the power of gitops in action by trying to make a change in the live cluster which would count as drift uh, and see GitOps override that change. So to reconcile that with what we've declared as what we want in, um, in GitHub. And then we will show you how to make a, a real and approved change for a PR uh, in a way which is nice and auditable and shows what we want to declare as our live state. Uh, so there are a few prerequisites. So we will be doing this with uh, a GitHub account. So if you are using GitLab, it should work. Um, feel free to, but does anyone have any issues using either a GitHub or a GitLab account to go through this demo? Please let us know in the chat if you do. We have plenty of time, so please do not be shy. The other prerequisites that we have are, well, we're using Kind as our Kubernetes cluster. You can bring your own uh, cluster if you prefer. Uh, we've had folks using Rancher, uh, K3D, um, Minikube, all the usual suspects. Uh, so yeah, if you will need Docker, you will need Kind if you want to follow on exactly, uh, and you'll also need kubectl uh, so we can do some port forwarding of the application itself if you want to see it in action. Cool. So yeah, just put in the chat. Um, you know, we definitely have had people before who don't have GitHub accounts um, uh, or alternatives, so it doesn't take too long to set that up, as well as uh, getting Kind set up. So uh, let us know if any of you need a few minutes to do that. Reminds me to start my kind cluster as well. And yes, we will have this um, recording available later, but we're happy to help you troubleshoot. We always like to know if uh, there's something we missed that uh, causes any issues. Please. I'm sorry wait. if my stomach rumbling makes it onto the recording. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, then it'll be both of us. They won't know which one of us. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite gotten to my breakfast yet. Um, yes, so please raise your hand if any of you need to set up a GitHub account out and or uh, set up kind. Just so we know, like I said, we've got this is a full two hour session, but we we wait for people and we still end up um, finishing pretty early. So we'll be able to get yep. through this. Any raise hands? That's good. Dokes. All right. If you ever do get stuck or you need us to pause, as I say, don't be shy. Put it in the chat. Raise your hand, and we'll we'll happily wait. Um, so grab the coffee, and he didn't hear <laughs> us asking you. <laughs> exactly. Yes. 
So the next thing you'll need to do is to install the Weave GitOps CLI. Um, so from this link in the week getting started guide, we have a command that you can copy paste. Um, I've already got it installed, so I'm not going to run that, but the output of this would show uh, GitOps version at the end. So just to check, I'm using the same one, which is 0.6. Uh, we have recently added homebrew support as well, which is quite a nice way to easily install it. It's using the same tap as EKS CTL, which is Weaveworks uh, CLI for interacting with Amazon EKS. Uh, if folks have heard of that already. So I know it's somewhere around 40, 50 meg, I think at the moment, the CLI. So it might take folks a little bit of time. If you could let us know that you've got the CLI installed in the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, but we'll wait a little while. And I uh, put in the chat and I mentioned as well, but I'll just make it completely explicit. Uh, you know, if you're if you've been interested in Flux and you want to get started, this is Flux. You'll you'll be using Flux and in fact, this will help install for you. Um, and soon, for people who've already been using Flux and want to take advantage of um, the Weave GitOps um, kind of as an add-on capability, uh, soon it will be fully integrated so that you can continue to use um, Weave GitOps with your existing um, Flux setup. Yes, so currently, if you have Flux installed on your cluster, um, that will be incompatible, um, but we are working very hard to remove that compatibility. So it should be a pretty smooth path. Yeah. Yeah, and let us know in the chat if any of you are already familiar with Flux or who is completely brand new, because that'll help us gauge um, how we want to cover the topics. How long are you estimating uh, the time would take for this step? Probably give it a minute. And I think we can move on. If anyone can let us know that they've successfully downloaded or still waiting, again, that would be really helpful. Help us pace accordingly. It's also good to see a couple of friends in here. Good to see everybody starting the year, uh, joining and getting started with GitHub. Okay, so I'll, I'll start talking about what we will be doing next. So yeah. the next thing that we're going to do is create a new repository. And this is what we will use um, as our kind of like source of truth for the cluster. Uh, so we work on a monorepo structure, uh, but that doesn't mean that your all of your application manifests or anything have to live in a single repo. It's far from that. It's more that we have one cluster, we have one repository which acts as the source of truth and then that will reference out into any subsequent repositories that you need uh, for your workload deployment. Um, so the first thing we'll do is create a brand new repository. So once you are ready, go to GitHub, click the plus, click new repository, give it a name and Make sure you initialize the repository as well. So the simplest thing to do is to add a readme. And then click repository, uh, create repository, and it should be done. I've created one in advance, but as you can see, this is now an empty repository just with a readme. Um, and yeah, and we should remind everybody, um, as we mentioned, um, Mark will rejoin us after we go through these steps to give um, guidance and some background as to um, how we structured these um, repos, because that's probably one of the most common questions that we have. So. Yep, and we'll see it in action as we go through this guide as well. Yeah. Uh, the other repository that you will need is a fork of our example repository. And this is because that we'll be pushing some changes to the repo, so you'll need write permissions to it. So there's a link in the getting started guide to pod info deploy. So you just need to go here, click fork. Uh, I've already got a fork of this, which is here. And it's currently the same. I've just changed some things around previously. And that's important to highlight the fork. 
because that's a core part of GitOps, right? So once you've got both of your repositories, let's go move this down a bit so we can actually access it. We can start to install Weave GitOps onto the cluster. So I'm going to kick this off, but please do say if you're starting to fall behind. So to install onto the cluster, you just have to do GitOps install and then provide the location of that repository that you've just created as dash dash config repo. Uh, so this one was, I think I just named it config repo, nice and simple. You can use the HTTPS or the SSH format for this, it doesn't matter. And this will basically install Flux, uh, so the GitOps toolkit, which comprises Flux. It will install um, the Weave GitOps components that build on top of Flux. And then once it has been installed onto your cluster, it will push those changes to this Git repo so that you can continue to manage your uh, GitOps runtime through Git. And again, if you ever want to update version, you can do that all through, through Git and that will then be deployed onto the cluster. And this will typically take mm, two minutes, depending on your system. There we go. So if I refresh this, I can see that I've now got a dot weave gitops folder, which has been created. You can have a quick look in that. Try opening it in VS Code Online because that's a little nicer to see. Make it a bit bigger. So what this has done is spat out a bunch of YAML because it's Kubernetes and Kubernetes loves YAML. Uh, we have a Git repository, which is our source object. We have a customization, which tells us what's actually going to be deployed. Uh, we have all of the components that make up the GitOps runtimes. So this is the controllers that you could see with, say, Git pods. And all of this is defined in Git in YAML. So anyone waiting for Weave GitOps to install, please let us know. I'll wait for a few seconds before we move on. Yes, and uh, while we are waiting, David, not to put you on the spot, but uh, <laughs> what, uh, you know, what, what are we looking forward to in Weave GitOps in the future? What are some things that you guys are bouncing around for roadmap? Oh, so much because we're in an exciting stage. Um, one of the things is trying to make it even more valuable to existing users of Flux and like, helping people learn what Flux is composed of. Um, we'd love to show like a native view on the primitives that Flux uses, like the Git repository object. So that's basically defining your source of what you want to get deployed and your customizations. Um, we are looking at the integration of Flagger as well. So you could start to do progressive delivery. Um, one of the main things that I would love to do is start to expose a bit more of the logs that come out of Flux. So for folks who encounter problems, like make that a little bit more front and center. So really help you debug things. Um, oh, there's so much I want to do with, with we for GitOps. It's very exciting. Excellent, excellent. But this is also why it's it's great running workshops like this and getting folks trying it out and helping us validate what what is more difficult or what what problems are you trying to solve with GitOps that we may be able to help you with in products. Yes, yeah, that reminds me. I did put in the chat. I know there's kind of a lot of chat going on, but uh, yeah, reminder to everybody. I did put in. Yeah, what what are the pain points that you're hoping uh, 
you know, GitOps will solve or some of these solutions will solve for you, maybe Kubernetes in general. Um, we're here to help and we'd love to hear. So, so we've GitOps comes with a fairly feature rich CLI, um, which you could do all of the steps that we're going through in this guide uh, using if you want. We'll be adding an app, which is actually just GitOps add app. Um, but we're going to take a more UI approach. So we're going to use a web app, which you can start by doing GitOps UI run. And this will open a browser. Um, that's our web app for adding applications, which you do by clicking the add application button. As you can see, I don't currently have anything running. So again, please do say if you're starting to fall behind, I'm more than happy to stop. Um, we are going to deploy the, the pod info application that you've already forked. So I'm just going to grab the URL from that repo. I'm going to call it pod info deploy. Uh, the Kubernetes namespace. So this is where we will be deploying the automation objects that Flux uses to reconcile. Like this isn't where your application will be deployed. So if this is um, an application that uses customize, uh, we're already declaring that it goes into a namespace called test. Uh, so that's where your application workloads will end up. This is where the automation ends up. Source repo URL. And the config repo URL. So this was the one which we have initialized on the cluster. So if I go to this one, just have to remember to change dev.com path. So this allows you to specify uh, the exact place within your source repo for your application of where the manifests are and what you want Flux to reconcile onto the cluster. In this example, having it as root is absolutely fine, but it depends on the application that you're trying to deploy. You can also specify the branch and you can specify whether you want to automatically merge it. This isn't typically something that you would be able to do if main is protected. Um, what we would usually do is create a branch, create a PR, and that gives you the nice audit trail and allow people to approve your changes. So, oh, so I just need to authenticate with GitHub. Oh, copied the wrong thing. And this is just asking for repo scope effectively so that it can write uh, to the repositories. In this case, the configuration repository, I should say. There we go. And that has created a pull request for my application. So we can click the link to see your pull request. Have a look at what's in there. So it's defining an application of the name pod info deploy. It's telling us the config repo that we're using and the application repo, telling it's type customized. So if you're just using raw Kubernetes deployment manifests, it's the same thing. Uh, you can also add Helm charts and Helm apps, uh, same as with Flux. Uh, we have a customization which builds everything. Uh, and this is what points us to uh, the actual app from our config repo. So assuming we're all happy with those changes, we can go and merge the PR. Delete the branch. And then if I go back to the applications page, this will be polling every 30 seconds to see uh, if there's anything on the cluster. Well, while we're, sorry, I don't want to jump in unless you had some steps you were going to go cover. ahead. No, oh yeah, I was just curious if, if, um, <clears throat> if anybody's stuck or, you know, if we're waiting on you, just, uh, again, to put you on the spot. But uh, some of the things I talked about at the beginning, sort of the cooked dinner, right? The um, uh, areas around, you know, the benefits of GitOps, the velocity, the uh, reliability, um, you know, uh, is there a little bit of a way to get these basic components?
components, these steps that we're going through to kind of remind us again of how we'll get to those places where we um, yeah, have easier troubleshooting and um, rollback and, and all that. So once you've got everything in Git, then you've got a very easy way to uh, see what has changed, see who has changed it, set restrictions as appropriate based on your access controls that you're already leveraging within your SCM. And that's a, one of the true powers of Git is it's it's augmenting your existing processes rather than trying to set up new uh, access control mechanisms, say. And because this is setting up a, a pool-based reconciliation with the cluster, it means that you don't necessarily even need access to a cluster to do anything like as, a, as an app developer or as an application operator. I can live in Git um, and I can make changes in Git and then the engine will take care of reconciling that and I can just view logs as appropriate. Um, so yeah, like if you say you made a erroneous change to an application, then restoring the desired state from when it was last acceptable is just as easy as reverting a PR. So you can, you can easily do it within well, seconds and maybe a minute or two <laughs> for it to actually reconcile on the cluster. Fantastic. Cool. So as I, this application has come up, so this is everything that has been deployed as part of pod info. So it contains namespace or the application that we have deployed it's referencing its namespace it has backend front end, which each have a service and deployment. The back end has a horizontal pod autoscaler. So this is a Kubernetes thing, which uh, will increase the number of replicas that are available for your pods, depending on like throughput, CPU usage, et cetera. And yeah, so you can see that everything has successfully come up. You see deployment resulted in a replica set, resulted in pods. Uh, we get some automation conditions, uh, which is basically telling us uh, the specific commit uh, that we last recognized from the source repo. Um, and if you look in this commit list at the bottom, you can see this matches uh, and it's saying like the last change that was made to this application was to update the horizontal pod autoscaler. If I wanted, I can click into that. I can see I changed them in replicas from two to one. So it's a very easy way to say like, oh, well, what actually changed on my system? What triggered a new deployment? Uh, and again, with the automation, it's saying which one has actually been applied on the cluster. So we can see the exact same one has been applied. Again, please say if you're starting to get uh, behind or if you have any questions. Uh, let's see where we got to in the guide. Did I forget anything? I don't think I did. Right, so now we can actually access the application. So to do this, you'll need to do a port forward. Uh, so you can copy the command from the guide. Then you should be able to access localhost. You see horrible gray one, because I've probably been tinkering around with this in the past. Yours will probably be blue. Yeah, so I've been playing around with this one in the past. But yeah, yours will look like this. Mine looks gray because I've already made a change to it. Right. So as I say, uh, PodInfo is just a very simple uh, web application, but it's designed to show best practices of microservices. If you go to uh, the actual PodInfo application, which is in the Stefan's repo, be able to find it with a quick search. You get a lot more details on what it actually does and some of the endpoints that you can see. So yeah, very fun app to check out and play around with. So now we're going to show some GitOps reconciliations. So first thing I'm going to do is kill the port forward, uh, just so I have access to the terminal again. And I am going to delete the front end I'm not sure what happens. I'm also going to kill my UI so I can have two terminals. 
And in this one, I will do a watch on the pods so you can see what happens live. So I'm going to delete a deployment. So it's going to delete the front end from my application. You'll see in the bottom terminal, I've now got it terminating and going away. And then what will happen in the background is Flux has uh, the customization, which is syncing every 30 seconds to a minute. Can't remember which one we had. And that will pick up that this is now uh, drifted from our desired state and it will start to create a new one, which it has. Oh, that was very quick, good timing. There we go. So I now have my new front end is back and running. So if something does go wrong in your, in your live system or if bad actor goes in and makes change that you don't want, this is how GitOps ensures that uh, you're always running what you want to be running. And you can set up intervals that match uh, the requirements of your organization and your application on a case-by-case -case basis, which is another one of the, the powerful features of Flux. So if we actually wanted to make a change to this application, then we can go through Git. So if I go into pod info deploy, uh, I'm gonna go to this, which is the deployment YAML. You can scroll down to find um, this color. Try to remember what it originally was. It would be good to, let's get it back to how it should be. So let's see what was, there you go. That's what it should be. So I'm gonna make that live change. Create new branch, create PR. Merge it. And then delete the branch. And what we should see again in this watch is that a change will be now detected in our desired state, which is different to our, our live state. And sure enough, new container starts to come up. Seems to be running. Wait for the old one to go away. Uh, we're good. So now I'm going to restart the port forward. And there you go. Much better. Nice and blue. So there you have it. And you can see GitOps reconciliation stopping a bad change going through and allowing you to automatically roll out updates based on a declared state in Git. Uh, we're gonna show a few more things, um, but before we continue, did anyone get stuck? Does anyone have any questions? We still have plenty of time. And again, yeah, we'd love to hear, um, yeah, what brought you here, right? Uh, hopefully we are uh, fulfilling in our promise to um, provide you what you were hoping to get, uh, the intro to Kubernetes and GitOps, um, actually being able to say that now you've, you know, gone through steps of GitOps and have been using it, um, which I think is exciting. Um, and of course, these, this guide is uh, readily available if you find that it is useful and you could share with your team. Uh, Stacy will be following up with an email that has links to our Slack channel. I think Stacy might have also included in our Slack channel in the chat here. Um, that's the great place where you know we'll follow up with you. If anybody wasn't able to complete, um, we're happy to complete the steps with you. If you had some kind of local laptop um, setup that uh, created issues, uh, certainly would like to know about that as well. I'm happy to help troubleshoot. Um, yeah, and then from here, like hopefully. Now you've experienced this very basic uh, setup. Oh, great, an error question. Uh, we have a install error. Ooh, interesting. We've got a couple people in the chat as well who might be able to address that. So we'll happily look into it. 
Um, and again, David, I can't remember, will we be talking? We kind of bounced around the idea of sort of talking about d disaster recovery a little bit, but are we still doing that or is that going to be our future? Yeah. No, I, I can do that now, actually, if you want. Yeah. So let's say someone does something really terrible like this and deletes their cluster. Uh-oh, it's all gone wrong. How do I recover? Spin up a new one. Or switch context. Well, we are um, just letting you know, we are looking into your error. So we'll hopefully come up with an answer. In the meantime, there's another question about, does GitHub Actions play well with this GitOps concept? Do those complement each other? Welcome. Yeah. So I'll quickly show this and then I'll jump to the question. Yes. So as a, what I've done is I've deleted that cluster. It's all gone. I've created a brand new kind of cluster. And all I need to do to get back to exactly where I was is to rerun install and the great thing this is it will match uh, the name of the cluster that had already been provided it will recognize that i'd already deployed that pod info uh, application so as part of flux bootstrapping itself and the engine um, coming online now we will have our application back so you can instantly get back to where you last wanted to be before your infrastructure failed and a very powerful thing of GitOps. Uh, so the question on do GitHub Actions play well? So, I mean, GitHub, GitHub Actions can do a lot of things. Many of them will play very well. If you are using GitHub Actions as kind of a deployment mechanism as well, so you're pushing into the clusters, that's where it's more, uh, more of a compete, I suppose. And this is where you can get into kind of a pull versus push model, uh, which makes more sense for your organization. Um, push obviously won't detect drift. Um, so there's nothing running on the cluster to verify that what you what you had asked to be deployed through your GitHub action is still the one that has been deployed. Uh, it also typically means that you need to give a lot of credentials to your CI system, in this case, GitHub actions, because uh, it will need access to all of your clusters. Uh, that, that can be a detractor for some, it's entirely based on use case. Uh, whereas if you're using a pull based model, then it's just the cluster reaches out to your GitHub repository uh, and you can have a much tighter control on those, um, those credentials. And it's far less blast radius if it's compromised. Hopefully that helps Sasha, but if you have any like more detailed questions or any specifics you want to go into, please do reach out. The other thing that I wanted to show was like, so when we went through the UI, uh, this was a just deployment manifest application. Uh, I thought it might be fun to show a hell map as a comparison. So you can see both running in a cluster. Uh, I'm gonna do that through the CLI, show a bit different. So for this, do GitOps add app-h. You can see all the different options that you need or you can provide to declare an application. Uh, I'm going to deploy Loki, which is a logging tool. So for that, I do GitOps add app. I need to pass the URL of the Helm repository, which I have somewhere around here. There it is. I uh, then need to specify the chart, which I think is Loki stack and say that this is a Helm release. That's right. That should work. Then the config repo.
Should be that. Let's see if I've made any mistakes. Cool, so that's raised PR. Uh, if you want, you can use things like the GitHub CLI, which is really handy. So you see the diff, maybe, is that the command? Yeah, so you can see what's being added again. And if you're happy, you can merge. So I'll start adding it to your cluster. And I'm going to squash the commits and delete the branch. And also just to show is like part of being additive to Flux, um, you can access the Flux CLI through GitOps Flux. Uh, so I could do GitOps Flux get all in the namespace ecosystem, which is where we GitOps is installed. And you can start to see that, sorry, because I've made, <laughs> you made the font so big, it makes this a bit garbled. Um, but we can see that we've got Helm repository. So this is our source uh, telling us where to grab the chart from. Uh, we've created Helm chart, Helm release object, and that is starting to reconcile. So if I look in Wego system, we should start to see, there it is. Loki starting to come up. So yeah, so this is how you can deploy, customize, Helm, whatever you like, all through, through Weave GitOps and Flux. I think that's, that's mainly what I wanted to share. So the last thing that we were going to go was a bit more in depth around um, our directory structure and like one of the decisions that we help you with as you're getting started. So obviously the one that we've been working with in your config repo like shows it fairly simple, but I've got a an example which I built earlier this afternoon uh, to show a kind of multi-cluster setup. So where is this one? This is a public repo, by the way. So you are more than welcome to poke around, see what you think, ask questions later in Slack. Um, but basically this is working with four local Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so two different versions of Kubernetes running with Kind, uh, a Minikube cluster and K3D. Uh, it has three different applications, sort of. Um, Pod info is uh, the direct one from Stefan's repo, and instead I'm specifying a particular path uh, to get to the customized manifest. Pod info deploy is the one that we typically use with GitOps, where the deployment manifests are just in the repo, and Loki, which is the Helm chart that I've just done. Uh, there's a few instructions from how I set this up, uh, but yeah, I think I will. I'll hand over to you, Mark, if you're ready and you can kind of talk through a bit more about this in action. Sure. Love talking about that. <laughs> All right. So hopefully everybody's seeing uh, that same repo that you were just talking about, David. Please uh, add a note in the chat if not. So we're just going to go through uh, real quick, so a couple things. So you'll notice that uh, it, uh, sorry, let me bump the font just a little. Is that better? Hopefully that's better. Is that big enough, David? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Okay, so you'll notice that we have it hidden in this hidden directory. So the original thinking was you might uh, combine Weave GitOps with maybe some of your other manifests or some of your other repositories there. So we just wanted to make sure that uh, we were always able to write into that directory and keep track of, of uh, the files that you need for your GitOps cluster. So I'm gonna go ahead and open um, the uh, VS code in the browser, which is something I just learned about, which I think is pretty darn cool. Uh, and it's GitOps, so I could modify things here. Uh, I probably can't in David's repo, but I could if I had my other repo. So, so what I wanted to do is just walk through this a little bit, uh, because we do get this question a lot. Uh, and actually, we spent a lot of time uh, wrangling around what we thought uh, would kind of work the best and make the most sense. So if we take a look at this cluster here, uh, David's kind cluster 1222.4, you'll see that underneath there, there's a system directory and a user directory. So 
what we wanted to do was separate uh, platform level workloads from user level workloads. So if you're familiar with Linux, uh, on Linux, you would do user local bin for all of your own binaries that you wanted to run, and you would have everything in the system in user bin. So that same kind of mindset is what we wanted to do here. Uh, so when you run install, it's going to set up your cluster based on your context of the cluster you're pointing at, uh, and then create a system and a user directory. So David went through these files real quick, but I just, so there's a GitOps runtime in here that is the entire manifest for Flux uh, in order to run your application. But in order to ensure that GitOps is managing GitOps, we need to set up a couple of syncs inside the cluster itself to know that when this changes, we will pick up changes. So for that, we create a customization that's for the WeGo system directory. And so uh, David mentioned that path before. You'll notice that this says, from my GitOps repo, pull in everything from the system directory. So what that tells us is Flux is going to go in and sync anything in here as a quote system level workload. Uh, since it's system level, you could change, you could set the interval for how often to check it. Uh, you could do different things for your system level workloads. But again, that's going to pull in you know the WeGo, WeGo applications, the configuration for WeGo, etc. That you see inside of this system directory. The benefit here is if I want to update Flux, I can update Flux itself for this particular cluster. And when I make those changes, they'll get applied because they're in the system level directory here. If we look at the user customization uh, file, so, so we had a system customization, but we also have a user customization. And that says, pull in everything from the user directory, sync that into my cluster. That's going to read this file that points to the applications that you have deployed uh, from this directory structure. So up here, I have uh, the Loki stack application, and I have pod info deploy uh, from in David's example here. So we have a couple levels of indirection that we set up automatically for you, and that provides a couple of things. One, uh, we're pointing at the WeGo repo the, or the config repo that I, I have exploded here. Uh, so that you can see where workloads get in and out of the system. Uh, and by having that level of indirection allows you to do things like, uh, for example, configure a branch maybe on here, right? That you want this cluster to sync this branch and this other cluster to sync a different branch. What that does, just like Git, right, is any workloads I move to that branch automatically go on to that system. So all the examples that David has done here today uh, all talk about, we just look at the main branch. Uh, but when you get into systems where you're having, you know, dev, prod, QA, et cetera, you're going to likely have those pointing at different points in time uh, for your repository so that you can control what goes uh, and gets deployed into those environments. So it's kind of the, the high High level concept is you want a directory structure layout that provides you a little ind indirection and flexibility there. Uh, so we have given two that we have clusters and apps. Under clusters, we, we wanted to separate the workloads between system and user workloads. And again, those are all pointers there. And when you configure what you sync from the repository, you'll likely want to specify references to say, you know, a branch is a good and easy one for everybody to understand, a dev branch. So a dev cluster is going to sync the dev branch, which means as I make changes to my config repo, they don't automatically go to those clusters until I merge it forward onto those different branches. So when you deploy an application dynamically from your other deploy repo, uh, we have that level of indirection. So you talk about the pod info deploy that uh, we deployed today. Uh, and if you take a look here, that is pointing at a different repository, this pod info deploy repository that gets synced from here. So that allows you to store all your manifests in that repository and that direct in direction that we provide in the apps thing sets up and does all the knitting together to make sure it gets laid out. So that was a real high level overview, but we spent a lot of time thinking through, you know, what's a what's a, a, a decent, decent place to start for your directory layout. And again, it's really comprised of two things, how you lay out the directory and tagging and branching that you use within that configuration repo. Cool. Thank you for that.
And um, yeah, I think that gets us to the toward the conclusion of our workshop. Uh, as I mentioned, we tend to finish these within about 90 minutes. Uh, again, if anybody, please don't be shy. If anybody needs help, uh, we can continue to help you here or um, Stacy will follow up, <clears throat> excuse me, with an email um, where you can join us on Slack if you haven't joined us there already and we're happy to help you uh, in real time or async, whatever works out to have you complete the steps. Um, we'd love to have your feedback as well. Like if this was a useful session, um, you know, we definitely want to make sure that we are answering people's questions, solving problems, providing tools that are helpful to having you all be successful and um, being able to gain the benefits of GitOps. As we mentioned, velocity, security, reliability, all those great things, right? Auditability. Um, a lot of abilities <laughs> we have out there. Um, certainly, we have benefited from GitOps um, even from the early days. You know, we, as a company, one of the earliest companies to be using uh, Kubernetes in production and you know building upon it and innovating upon it. Um, and we have many people in our community who are as well. So we hope that you will enjoy those benefits. So, if there aren't any final questions, then we hope to see you in Slack. Uh, I think again very much um, Mark for um, the various talks from our engineering side. Um, I'm sure you'll be talking to Mark as well as uh, with David Harris. Thank you for giving us the walkthrough and product. Um, David's also added an email address so you can follow up personally. Uh, and thanks again to Stacy uh, for putting this together and our community managers Stacy and Vanessa will be happy to help you in the Slack channel. So please uh, see us there. Stacy has posted that um, as well as yes, all the future talks, Stacy and Vanessa are heads down on building out our spring calendar of great, great talks on a wide range of topics. So the best single point of truth is looking at one of our um, in groups, group pages on Meetup. The calendars there are the best way to sign up and be alerted of future events. So uh, give us feedback as well on other things you'd like to hear. We're happy to um, provide plenty of content for you. So thank you so much again, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.